All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode number thirty-three. And uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of stuff today. Not that many articles, to be honest, but um, quite a bit of releases, pretty major ones, and some pretty neat libraries and demos, and as well some very interesting and silly stuff uh, to close this all off. Hey, Tomo, welcome to the stream. So. Without further ado, let's get started. The first article we got today is called Using React Context API Getting Started. This is what you would call a comprehensive tutorial on using React Context API. In this case, the author walks you through building your own themed app or themed components, if you would. And uh, not just using the React Context API, which is sort of the main focus of the whole tutorial, but also using the styled components if you never heard about them. This actually does give you a pretty good introduction to the styled components too, which is a very nice um, addition, I guess. There's also a bunch of videos if you are not you know, into reading uh, a lot of text, you can just watch the walkthrough through all of the bits of the tutorial, which works quite nicely. So. If that sounds like an interesting topic, it is a very detailed article and it does walk you through just about everything you need to know about uh, React context and styled components and using them together to create themes for your components or app. So, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is quite good. Next article we got is lessons learned from creating reach, uh, sorry, creating a reach text editor with real time collaboration. This is a retrospective article from the team behind the CK editor. If you never heard about them, this is a pretty like one of the best, I would say editors uh, for JavaScript uh, that basically are configurable and have a lot of features. And uh, I've used it in a bunch of projects, I think it was CK editor three at a time, so it was quite some time ago. They've released CK Editor 5 recently. It has a lot of features, including the real time collaboration feature, which was um, announced quite, you know, promoted quite heavily because this is a very tricky feature. And this is sort of the deep dive to have a look at how exactly uh, can you achieve the real time collaboration? What kind of problems will you encounter and how you can solve them? So, there's actually very interesting points here about merge conflicts, for example. So, I assume that would be a problem, but I never actually gave it, you know, too much thought. And from the way they describe it, actually, this seems to be insanely complicated problem. And obviously, there are ways to solve it. And they walk through that as well. So yeah, it is not as simple as you would think, you know, just just editing text from multiple places. So if that sounds like an interesting uh, retrospective for you, if you are interested in seeing how you can actually achieve real time collaboration in something like uh, text editing, or actually what you see is what you get text editing, right? Because the CK editor is a rich text editor. So it actually allows you to do like images and HTML and styles and everything. So it is very interesting to read about all that and um, their approach to doing uh, this sort of uh, solving the, you know, diffing problems and conflicts and all that kind of stuff. So do check it out. It is a really, really cool uh, retrospective and uh, overview of how they achieved the real time collaboration. Next article we got is called bit fields in JavaScript, because sometimes you need a TARDIS. Um, so this <laughs> Um, I'm not sure why it talks about TARDIS. I am not a huge Doctor Who fan, so I, maybe I just don't get a reference. But here's the thing. So this article talks about the bit fields in JavaScript, right? So if you never heard about bit fields, the idea is that you can use specific bits to um, specify the features and then use the bitwise operators to quickly determine what kind of features are enabled. This is incredibly powerful technique that can save you a lot of um, performance, they, you know, it's really high performant, it doesn't need a lot of space. It's literally just one variable holding the bits, right? The problem is I am terrible at that. So every time I have to implement something like this, and I don't really think I've had to do that that many times, I have to Google it again. And this article does a really good job at explaining what it does and how you can actually use that, how you can create your own bitwise fields, how you can operate on bit fields, uh, how you can setting the values and basically everything you need to know about that. And I think this is going to be an article that I would just bookmark somewhere and come back when I need to implement that again, because I will forget 90% of that. Hey, Bagao, welcome to the stream. Uh, so yes, if you've never heard about bit fields and about their usage as the feature toggles or you know, the settings, basically, 
do check it out. If you are forgetting things just like me, uh, then check it out as well. It has a very good overview on, you know, just about everything you want to know about that. Um, if you already know and use them everyday life, you won't find anything new in here. I mean, this is pretty much the sort of overall overview. There is actually a bit fill library there as well that I completely forgot about that sort of aims to simplify all of that. And uh, I probably should check it out and see if that will make my life better. Uh, but um, this is something for the next time. Okay, next article we got is functional JavaScript with ES6, Booleans, conditionals and operators. Um, this is a very, very functional programming heavy and Lambda calculus heavy article that basically re-implements booleans, conditionals and operators using functions because, you know, it's functional programming and Lambda calculus, right? So um, there is, you know, there is a lot of explanations here what exactly those do and how do they work. But if you never worked with functional programming, it might be a bit hard to understand all of that. So this is like a small warning before you get into it. But if you are interested in functional programming, and if you're interested to see how exactly you could apply like Lambda calculus and functional programming in JavaScript and how you can actually, how, it, how can it make your life uh, better or worse, or, you know, different, let's put it this way, because it's, it's, it's not a panacea, right? So it doesn't really cure everything. Uh, Nonetheless, it is a very good article that does explain uh, what it takes out to explain very well. So once you read it, you will understand how you can implement all those conditionals and operators and booleans using purely functions. It does a very good job of explaining what the hell is going on. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you have any interest in functional programming, I would recommend reading it because this is quite useful. I have issues with carrying. Uh, why? I mean, carrying is a very simple concept, right? It's just like you take one argument and return a function that applies anything else to the new function. That's, that's basically it, right? So it's a very simple concept. I think you maybe just don't still, it doesn't click with you. I had that problem as well. When I only started, when I just started um, learning the function of programming, I also had a lot of hard times with stuff like, you know, carrying and binding and um, I mean, okay, binding is actually JavaScript related concept, but whatever. Uh, stuff like yeah, carrying and optional application and whatever else until one moment. I don't remember. I think it was like the definitive functional programming uh, book or something among those lines. It all just clicked for me. And then it became apparent that all of those concepts are actually super stupid and super simple. And most of the times it's just really hard to explain them because or people are explaining them using the sort of Lambda calculus language or, you know, the functional programming terminology that makes it all very confusing. But when you look at the code, it's actually really, really straightforward. But okay, let us continue with the articles. Um, next one we got here is understanding design patterns in JavaScript, learn about various design patterns in JavaScript. Exactly as the title says, this is essentially a walkthrough in the through the existing design patterns, uh, specifically uh, with regards to JavaScript. So if you're already familiar with all the design patterns that are out there, like, you know, the module pattern, the uh, variations of module pattern, essentially the uh, what is there, the singletons, the interfaces and all that kind of stuff. You won't really find anything new here. Yeah, the factories, obviously. But if you never heard about them, or maybe you heard about one or two, maybe you don't know what the decorators are, maybe you don't know what the factory is, then this article will give you a really good starting point and will explain uh, the core patterns quite well. Nothing really to add beyond that. I mean, it is a very straightforward article that just, you know, talks about design patterns. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, if you don't know them, go have a read. If you know them, then there's nothing really new here. That's about all I have to say. Right, next article we got is the history of front end frameworks. This one is really, really cool. So essentially, as it says, it is a recollection, I guess, of a history of HTML, CSS and JavaScript and front end frameworks. It goes to talk through, you know, the start of the web and start of the HTML specification, which was written uh, by Tim Berners Lee. 1991. And then the whole like browser wars troubles with CSS that GIF is still the most hilarious thing you would ever see about CSS. It's also very poorly compressed, it seems but uh, you know what, whatever. <laughs> oh, yes, the um, 
the whole acid tests and CSS implementation problems in Internet Explorer 7, if you've never seen it, this is the acid test. This is how it should look. This is the CSS thing, right? And this is how it looked in Internet Explorer 7. This wasn't even the worst thing. There were browsers that displayed this thing worse than that. So yeah, it was a bit of a problem. And then the whole process, you know, of, of standardizing the CSS, standardizing the JavaScript, standardizing the HTML, the whole W3C thing, foundation, the releases of the more modern frameworks and so on and so forth. So if you never knew about the history, it's actually very interesting to see where all of that stuff comes from. So if you started, you know, developing JavaScript recently or working on front ends recently, if you're wondering how did we get from not being able to write classes in JavaScript to React, which basically uses classes almost exclusively, right? This might be a very good place to start. It does recaps everything that happened pretty well and talks a bit about the future and what kind of stuff can we expect. It's all very interesting. And, uh, you know, even though I've sort of worked through um, majority of it, maybe not all, you know, in like 90s, I was just uh, what you would call a script kitty, I guess, and just copy pasting everything from Stack Overflow and being terrible with my websites. But I did get to work with majority of stuff that happened in early 2000s, which was pretty fun, basically. So yeah, it is fascinating to uh, sort of relieve that again and remember all of that terrible and terrifying and beautiful things that happened before and how good the web development is actually right now. Okay, but yeah, <laughs> let's continue. The next thing we got is a scalable React components architecture article that talks about uh, it's actually more of an example uh, article sort of that talks about hey you know so we take this component we build a component that in this case it's an emoji list component that searches through emoji by the text and allows you to find any emoji you want right pretty straightforward then the author shows how he built it initially and how you can actually refactor it to make it more um flexible right so how do you actually separate it how you, how do you make it more scalable how do you actually split it off how do you make it uh, more customizable nicer to navigate and so on and so forth so if you are developing components and you are still confused about the refactoring and how you can make your components better this one is a pretty good starter point i mean it's not an extremely large article but it does have some uh, nice points here okay next article we got is how to stop using console log and start using your browser's debugger you just don't do that. <laughs> it's like I've been um, I've been developing in JavaScript ex almost exclusively for the past I don't know ten years, and I'm still using console log for debugging. That is the easiest way to debug stuff. I know it's a terrible way, and uh, from time to time, when you have very complex things going on, you do need a debugger, and you do need to you know set the breakpoints and everything, but. Oh man, I'm still using console log too much. But back to the article, it actually talks about, uh, so this is I would, what, what you would put it, it's a tutorial on how to debug things using a proper debugger, right? In this case, talking specifically about the Chrome DevTools debugger, which is an extremely powerful tool. And if you never used it, this is a very good starting point that will walk you through everything you have to know about it, how to put the breakpoints, how to start, how to get the scope and how to post the execution on exceptions and stuff like this, basically. How to step through codes and whatever you have to know to get through the debugging process, right? So it's not, uh, if you already debug something, if you already know what the watch expressions are, what the scope, how do you navigate the scope, how do you execute the function step by step, you won't really find anything new in here, right? Uh, but if you are still confused, if you are still exclusively using console log, which again, you know, works for majority of cases, but from time to time, you got these cases when it just gets too hard and you actually need debugging and stepping through and uh, over the functions to actually figure out where it all goes wrong. Knowing this is really helpful. So if you don't know how the debugger works, this is a very, very good um, starter for it. Okay. Next article we got is WebAssembly for buzzword haters. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a clickbaity title, but what it actually is, is an article talking about what the WebAssembly is and what can you do with it? And will it, and answering a bunch of, you know, typical questions that you would hear when you talk to a person who first time hears about WebAssembly and starts asking 
uh, about different things like, you know, what kind of browsers are supported, how can I use it, where can I use it, and so on and so forth. So it's not nothing major here, but if you never heard about WebAssembly, this is a very good starting point that will, in a plain English, outline and explain everything you want to know about WebAssembly. WebAssembly FAQ, exactly. So this is ex essentially frequently asked questions about WebAssembly, and it's perfect for people who never heard about it. Um, right. Continuing, we got a sync function versus a function that returns a promise. Uh, this is also not exactly a large article, but it does cover this one tricky point about uh, just writing a function that you know returns a promise versus writing an async function that returns a promise. And the whole um, the whole thing is that uh, the error is or god damn it, um, the whole problem is with the error handling, right? So those two functions will handle the errors differently and the error bubbling will work differently. And if you never worked with those two different types of functions, you might not immediately get that. But you know, if you work enough with promises and if you work enough with the sync functions, you will know exactly what the problem is here. If not, then I mean, it's not exactly a super hard problem to tackle, but it is there and you have to be aware of it. So if you never heard about that, do check it out. This is a pretty good explanation of what the hell is the difference and why exactly is it important to know it. Okay, next thing we got is conditional JavaScript for experts. Very, very, very in-depth article talking about conditionals in JavaScript. Uh, what is the conditionals? Truthy, faulty, uh, evaluations, short circuiting and uh, yes, using statements instead of expressions and basically whatever you wanted to know about conditionals in JavaScript is likely going to be in this article. If you already know everything there is to know about the conditionals, you won't really find anything new here. I mean, there is like order of execution and some very complex uh, conditionals and nested ternary operators. That is something you, in my opinion, at least you should very rarely try to do that in real code because it is hard as hell to read even one ternary and if you have like two of them my brain just starts exploding when i see something like this it's like how do you even read that this is the worst code you can write three nested ternary and if you just look at this line you cannot like a human would take five minutes to decipher that which is why you should probably write only one ternary and make it easier for your colleagues and your your future self but yeah, basically, you know, if you want more uh, deep dive into JavaScript conditionals, do check this out. It is pretty good. Okay, next thing we got is how to apply solid principles in React applications. Specific, so a very uh, detailed look into solid principles, but uh, specifically with regards to applying them in React apps. Um, if you never heard about solid, it is a pretty widespread uh, software development principle. That is the single responsibility, open, closed, list of substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion principles, which are, you know, kind of supposed to be the best practice to follow, right? And, um, okay, wait a second. Let me just, there's a message. Why is it held by Automod? Uh, yes, allow, yes. Oh yeah, because it has a word while in psychopath likely. <laughs> Come on, for reals, you're gonna ban that? <laughs> Uh, Twitch bots seem to be a bit crazy. Always code if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. I mean, first of all, I really like that quote. Second of all, it's kind of true because the person who's going to be maintaining your code in majority of cases is going to be future you, right? And you are kind of know where you live. And once you find out that it was you who write the code, you are either going to be very upset or very angry at yourself. So just, you know, just, just write, write good code. <laughs> But okay, back to the article. So we got the single responsibility principle and I, okay, so I listed the solid principles, right? So basically what the article does, it walks through them and talks, uh, how do you apply those with regards to React and, uh, sorry, React components and React specifically, and what can you do to make your code slightly better and to um, adhere by those principles. Now, I always, I think I already noted this more than once, but I think that uh, blindly following the principles, be it solid principle or dry principle or whatever, doesn't really help anyone. It's okay to repeat yourself. It's okay to make the things that are 
not really single responsibility. It's okay to make something that doesn't scale because unless you need to scale it, it doesn't actually matter how bad it is, right? So if it works and if it delivers the functionality that is required right now, there is no real reason to create needless abstractions just to purely not repeat yourself, right? So this is actually, I would say this is more harmful than you know repeating yourself two or three times, having wrong abstractions. But anyway, uh, if you're interested in seeing the solid principles applied to React applications, and if you are curious about how that would work, do check this article out. It does give a pretty good examples. Okay, next article we got is creating a logger in Node.js from scratch. Exactly what it says, you will create a logger uh, from scratch on your own. The logger will have uh, all the typical logger features like levels, transports, default transports, templates for printing, output formats, and all that kind of stuff. So if you ever wanted to build your own logger and to, or maybe you wanted to know how exactly it's made, I also think that there's a bit of JavaScript blocked so we don't really see all the code here. Yep. So if you ever wanted to build your own logger, then do check this article out. It walks you through everything you want to know, all the you know things that you would expect from a typical model logger. And after you read this, you will be able to build your very own logging package for Node.js and do it with a bit of a tweaking for uh, browsers as well. So if you drop the files output, for example, it should just work in a browser too. Pretty good article. Okay. Next thing we got is the ultimate guide to execution context, hoisting scopes and closures in JavaScript. So this is the um, pretty lengthy article that is also part of advanced JavaScript course that is from the same author that we, um, we saw his tool last week that was called JavaScript. Where he, there was a link somewhere here, wait a second. JavaScript, um, oh God, I, the, <laughs> That is the, uh, right, there we go, JavaScript Visualizer. This is what I wanted to say. Okay, so this, just to remind you, this was a tool that allows you to execute um, code step by step and see the changes in the execution context, including the scopes, including the context, including the, uh, I don't know, whatever you can imagine basically, right? It's amazing tool for understanding the context of execution, the scopes, and everything you might want to know about that kind of stuff. So this is exactly what the article talks about, right? Execution context, hoisting scopes and closures. And uh, what it does is actually takes this tool and demonstrates on the examples how all of those things, meaning scope, hoisting, closures, uh, and execution context work in a very visual manner, which is actually really great. And I wish I would have something like this when I learn JavaScript because those like the closures and hoisting and scopes are probably one of the most confusing concepts in JavaScript. At least it was to me when I just started learning them. And I spent a lot of time like, you know, breaking a lot of things because I simply didn't understood how the closures work or how the scoping works. And this gives you a perfect explanation of what to expect, even with like very neat visualizations showing you what exactly is going on in terms of, you know, here's the global context, here's the local function context, here's how it all handles. It is amazing. So if you still have issues with scopes, if you still have issues with hoisting and execution context, then do check this article out. It will likely clear up 90, 95% of questions you have. It is really, really, really good. Looking for a JavaScript string in JavaScript article is not best filter, exact. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is definitely was not a smart way of doing things, but I found what I was looking for, that what matters. It is a great article for anyone who is still not, you know, 100% sure on all of those concepts. I, I don't think I am 100% sure myself, but I can, roll with it 95% of time, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, next article we got is smart bundling, how to serve legacy code only to legacy browsers. A really neat article that talks about the cost of supporting old browsers and also how to actually deal with it. The numbers are actually pretty crazy, even when transpiling to ES5, which is, well, not exactly the old JavaScript, right? So there's older browsers, but uh, hopefully you don't have to support them. You already have more than 20% of added costs in size just from using ES5, which is insane. 
And then you add the polyfills on top of that, and then you add CSS prefixing on top of that, and you come out with a app bundle that is almost twice as big, just because you support legacy browser, right? So this article talks about what exactly is legacy and modern, right? And how you actually transpile and polyfill, and how do you split those uh, bundles into ones that actually uh, but basically by uh, detecting the browser, right? And serving the modern bun bundle to the modern browsers so that users won't have to download the outdated polyfills and uh, ES5 and serving the legacy bundle to the older browsers so that they can actually, your app still works. So that sounds like an interesting topic, which I think it absolutely is. Do check it out. This article have uh, pretty much everything you need to get started. Okay, next thing we got is why using reduce to sequentially resolve promises works. Uh, we don't support legacy browsers in my company. That is awesome for you. Like, I, like it's really cool when your clients don't have Internet Explorer 7 or 8. I think the last company I worked for, we had IE 8 as a requirement and I had to like install a virtual machine to actually test anything with it. It was a bit of a painful experience. So it's really cool if you don't have to support this stuff because it's it, it's not a very good experience. <laughs> but again, back to articles. Uh, why using reduce to sequential resolve promises works. Uh, this is something I did not know was possible, but it's pretty cool. So you can actually use reduce to sequential resolve promises, which kind of makes sense, right? Because the reduce returns the previous value and then you can do something with the next value, which means you can return the previous promise and chain it with then with the next promise, which kind of makes sense. But the way it is executed is actually slightly different, right? So, and if you're interested in how exactly it works, because um, it's actually gonna go through the whole reduce first and then the promises will start to resolve. So in the end, you're gonna get the final promise returned but it's gonna be already after the all the whole loop executed. So it's sort of, it's a bit tricky basically, but it's it's very interesting exercise into seeing how reduce works under the hood. And if that sounds interesting, do check it out because it's it has a couple of interesting points that I never thought about, to be honest. All right, next thing we got is searching and sorting text with dia, ugh, let me try that again, with diacritical marks in JavaScript. So diacritical marks is this sort of um, squiggly things that you sometimes get on letters or, you know, the crossed O and uh, umlauts from German and whatever. There's a bunch of languages that basically have them, right? So like German, Swedish, Scandinavian languages specifically, I think, uh, Italian, Spanish, they all have those letters that are kind of look like a Latin letters, French as well, yes, that's true. But they are not quite because they have some added uh, uh, things and those are called diacritical marks, right? Or is it diacritical marks? I always confuse this. So, and if you try to do the string search, you will obviously not match the words because those are different letters. Uh, and it's a pretty common problem specifically for the um, e-commerce shops because you always have products that have a bunch of names and the brands can have those things in them and people will never type those specific letters because they will, you know, if you, if you have a brand with umlauts and the person is from US, he doesn't have that on his keyboard. He will just search using a normal letter, right? And you as a developer will have to deal with that. So this article talks how you can actually do that specifically with JavaScript which I, you know, I guess it's a, uh, it's an interesting topic and there is some things that JavaScript, uh, some tools that JavaScript provide to actually um, figure it out. And there's some approaches to doing it yourself. Like for example, replacing the, uh, so normal, normal, ugh, God damn it. This <laughs> speaking is hard. Okay. Let's try again. Like normalizing the strings by replacing the characters with uh, normal, letters, right? And in this case, uh, since those characters are actually UTF-8, they are composites. So there's actually two UTF-8 symbols and one. So that means you can remove that additional symbol as a, a bit of code snippet here that shows how to exactly do that. And all of that is really, really cool and really interesting. Now, the thing is that you might not always want to do that in JavaScript because, you know, considering that we are talking e-commerce and larger databases of products, you actually want your database to be able to do that. And if we're talking search, then 
you just take something like Elasticsearch and it has this functionality built in, for example. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, and when I discovered that, I was really happy because that basically takes away quite a lot of headaches. But if you're interested in, you know, doing that yourself or how you can actually do that yourself, this article does give you a pretty good explanation of what's going on, why do you need it and how you can actually achieve that. Okay, next article we got is a wild way to check if number is prime using a regular expression. So this is an entry in a terrible code that you should never write, but that is still really cool and amusing. Um, next time someone will ask you to write a check for prime numbers in you know the job application or something, try to do that. Try to use a regular expression that will actually try to see if, if the number is prime and um, see their reaction. <laughs> Because that thing actually works, that, that there is a regular expression that genuinely checks if the number is prime, which is bloody insane. And the article goes into, you know, first of all, we got the regular expression, obviously, and then we have the pretty lengthy explanation on how exactly it works, which is also absolutely fascinating and absolutely something you should not use in, in, in real life, because this is, this is going to be painful to... Um, to actually check how far can it go i believe it is uh, so there's an yeah there you go the regex is also hindered by the fact that the max length of a string in the most browsers is going to be around 268 million so this is your limitation it's basically a string length and uh yeah it it's you know as long as the string fits it will work so it doesn't really matter uh it seems pretty flexible <laughs> which is again insane but a really cool example of crazy things that you can actually do with uh, with the regular expressions. Okay, uh, last thing we got in the articles today is this announcement from GitHub blog. Get ready, game off returns in November. So um, the GitHub is organizing the annual game jam called Game Off. And it starts on November 1st and will go for 30 days. So you have 30 days to build a game. It can be in any language, including JavaScript. And then you submit it and there will be like judges and I think some prizes or something. So, you know, if you're building uh, games and you wanna participate in another jam, that sounds like a fun time. Or maybe, you know, if you wanted to build games, just do have a look, that looks pretty cool. Okay, continuing, we got some uh, tiny things that I just wanted to highlight. Basically, the first one of them being REPL it adding free HTTPS ready custom domains for websites and servers. So if you didn't know, REPL it is basically um, REPL in a browser where you can use quite a lot of languages, not just JavaScript. There's like Node, C Sharp, Ruby, Python. And uh, you just literally click it, you get a nice environment with the access to shell and everything and you can publish it uh, but I think by default the sources are public basically it was all nice and, and easy and now you can basically tie in your own domain uh, to that and it will be served with https and it's free which is kind of awesome so there you go Next tiny thing we got is this article talking about TypeScript versus Flow. I know that a lot of people are still, you know, I, I get too many questions about this and I'm not using TypeScript and I'm not using Flow. So it's really hard for me to answer those, but this article might actually answer some questions that you have. So this is sort of a perspective of a person who used both TypeScript and Flow for some time and then compares them and outlines the differences in a few bullet points. So if you are interested, do check it out. It is not extremely big, but maybe you'll find your answer over here. Next thing we got is understanding NPM link, a pretty short tutorial and explanation on, uh, first of all, how to use NPM link. And second of all, what does NPM link actually do with your file system and with your packages? So if you were still confused about it, do check it out. It does explain pretty nicely. Next thing we got is tschool.js, generate a PDF file from HTML and CSS in Node.js. A pretty neat approach to generating invoice PDF files uh, using what essentially is uh, Puppeteer and Pug.js, Pug.js being the templating system and Puppeteer is the headless Chrome. So the author decided, okay, you know, I'm just gonna render the invoice in HTML and then load it with Puppeteer and save it to PDF, which works really well and it's like a really cool approach. So there's a tschool.js um, function. 
It is a very strange name. I totally agree. That is, I'm not sure why it's called like this, but um, there you go. I mean, there's a library. So, you know, if you're not interested in seeing how it was developed, you can just take it and use it. It seems to be working quite nicely. Okay, uh, next thing we got is using MongoDB as real time DB with the Node.js. A very short tutorial on uh, using MongoDB changes streams to react to the changes in real time using WebSockets. If you were not aware of that feature of the MongoDB, it is actually possible now to use it as a real time database and actually watch for changes in specific collections which make it very nice uh, and very well fit for, you know, ca cases where uh, before it was a bit of a pain in ass to set up like the chat app, for example. So now when you push messages to a specific channel, you can just watch for changes and uh, emit that to a user through the socket. That works really well. So if you want to see the basic setup, the article covers it and uh, everything else you can find in the MongoDB documentation. And uh, the last thing I have in the tiny things today is the GitHub Actions introduction. So if you never, well, not never, if you still haven't heard about it, GitHub, action, uh, GitHub introduced Actions uh, this week, I think. And it's basically gonna be sort of deployment recipes or I guess action recipes because they're not specifically deployment ones. Uh, the actions right now are in limited access phase, like alpha, beta, or whatever. And you can only get them if you apply and they pick you basically for the next wave. Ready to hit the button myself, but they didn't pick me yet. But, you know, those guys apparently were picked. And they got an early look on it. So, and this sort of tutorial walks you through how they work. And it seems like you can create quite a lot of things um, related to that. Like you can publish to NPM, for example. So... I'm really curious to see how that will impact things like Travis CI or, you know, any other CI services, because at least from those screenshots that we see over here and from the description, it seems like you can literally just use GitHub Actions instead of CI because, you know, it can publish 10 PM. It can likely run tests. Maybe it seems it can deploy to Azure, which is kind of insane. I guess maybe the Travis would be one of the actions that you're going to touch. So, it, it's really exciting and uh, pretty cool to see GitHub, you know, developing, finally starting to go into that direction. Um, hey, Malevolo, welcome to the stream. First time managed to catch me live. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for trying to catch me live. That really means a lot to me. Okay, we are done with the tiny short things. And now we are at the releases section. The first major release of the week being V8 version 7.0 and Chrome 70 released. Um, the highlight for me in the V8.7.0 is, well, I mean, we have the embedded built-ins. We already talked about them quite a lot. And the, you know, the idea is that actually they save, uh, uh, sorry, they are save memory by sharing the generated codes across multiple V8 isolates, which is always nice, you know, have more memory. Maybe people will finally stop complaining about uh, Chrome eating too much memory. But that's not the most exciting part. The most exciting part is that we actually got a preview of WebAssembly threads. They are still behind the flag, but you can enable them. And um, yeah, WebAssembly now got threads and they're already working. They're already shipped, which is mind blowing. The speed of development for WebAssembly is insane. And it's pretty exciting to see all of that. Uh, the Chrome itself got obviously V8 7.0 integrated as well as a bunch of uh, Chrome related features. First of all, you got the desktop progressive web apps on Windows and Linux enabled by default. So now when you go to the progressive web app, you actually will get the uh, pop-up dialogue that asks you to install the app on desktop. And once you do that, it will actually open in a separate window and behave as a separate standalone app, which is kind of awesome. So we had that on mobile devices for quite some time. Now we finally get that on desktop and that works really, really well. And uh, Mac support will arrive in Chrome 72 because there are some issues related to uh, all that stuff. The next highlight we have is the credential management API, which is awesome. So this is the, again, the spec we already talked about on this podcast that allows you to do passwordless sign-ins using your credentials. And uh, it seems like it's now shipped as well, at least in Chrome. So... I'm going to be curious to see how that develops and if there is any websites that will adopt it in the near future. If Google themselves would adopt it in the near future, that would be very interesting if you could use, say, uh, login into Gmail, for example, or any Google accounts using your 
credential management API and your public credentials from your computer, right? That will be very interesting to see. We also get named workers. So now instead of just starting a worker, you can actually name it so that you can uh, debug them properly later on, which is quite nice. And there's a bunch of other things like web Bluetooth, for example, shipped in Windows 10. But yeah, it is, it is another pretty major update and it's really cool to see the web developing. All right, the next uh, major update of the week we got is Style Components version 4 with a lot of uh, improvements and changes. It is now smaller and much, much faster. It has the uh, refreshed Create Global Style API that is going to be replacing the old Inject Global. And it is now uh, working in strict mode, uh, React 16, like fully compliant and uh, React no longer complains about it, has native support for refs and a bunch of other things. So if you are working with styled components, do check it out. It seems to be relatively easy to upgrade to it actually, but provides a lot of benefits. If you never use them, do check them out. Maybe this is the way of styling your React, Preact, view components that you were looking for. I believe it also works with view, but I might be confused here because I never tried it. So don't take my word for it, just uh, check it out. Next release we got is Inferno version 6.0. If you never heard about it, Inferno is an alternative to React, Preact, or any other of the front-end frameworks that is supposed to be super fast and it's supposed to be the fastest on the market which I don't know how true it is actually because Preact has been gaining quite a lot of speed lately. Um, they had benchmarks, but I don't know if they have any uh, data for benchmarking available. Uh, more fra I mean, it is quite an old framework. So this is definitely not a new one. Uh, it's been around for a few years now, I think. Yeah, there you go. There's a two years file read me here on the benchmarking. And I don't know if they actually provide any hard data. Um, UI bench. Uh, so this only allow, oh, okay. So we can actually run that and check out the, I guess I just, yeah, allow JavaScript. Where's my start button? Um, open, you can, can I, how do I start the tests? Test filter, if I enable full-time render. Where's my start button? Set, just zoom, no, okay, how do I? Uh, to start benchmarking, click on a button below. Uh, is that? No, that's a star button. Where's the start button? What button below? I don't see. Custom URL, I guess that is not, uh, do I click on a stable button? Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> that was a bit confusing. All right, I figured it out. That wasn't um, wasn't too hard. So we got the React benchmark. We can try to compare it with React and Preact and actually see what the speed difference is. I mean, it's supposed to be like the fastest on the block essentially. Okay, uh, will we get that rendered as a nice and convenient data? I'm guessing not, but table render. Um, okay, you know what? You can, <laughs> you can compare it yourself because before they used to have those really nice charts that would basically denoted everything and explain them in a very concise manner. Now you basically have to run everything yourself, which is uh, slightly annoying. So uh, do, you know, if that sounds interesting, if you are looking for a faster framework, do check it out and compare it to Preag because it might be faster. At least this is, this was their design goal. So it's not actually small, but rather it is very, very fast on updates. And uh, yeah, so they have like, you know, updated the Babel 7, changed some things underneath and uh, added some new things like create ref API from React, which everyone seems to be taking because it's actually quite nice. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, how do I put it? It's, it's not, it's an interesting framework, right? Built specifically for speed. So if you need speed, do check it out. It also seems to be failing in some versions of Internet Explorer and Safari, which is uh, interesting. Okay, continuing, we got a version seven of AngularJS, which is um, again, mind blowing that they are releasing major versions so frequently. But um, another interesting point is actually this version of Angular doesn't really have any breaking changes to six but because they have this policy that they will re, uh, release major versions every half a year anyway, this is why we're getting Angular 7. So it's slightly confusing, but there we go. Uh, again, there is no major changes. There's just a bunch of bug fixes and performance improvements. 
So I guess, you know, if you're using Angular, then probably it's a good idea to update. They released too much versions. I mean, I wouldn't call it too much, but I, it's like, you know, it could have been like 6.3 or whatever, 6.2. I don't know what 6. Point what they have now, but why do you just force a release of major version when there's no breaking changes? It's like Semver, no, nobody cares about Semver. But anyway, if you are using Angular and curious, or I guess, you know, if you, I, I mean, if you're using it, you're probably already updated because it seems like there's literally zero breaking changes. If you're not using Angular, then well, um, maybe have a check it out. Maybe this is what you want. I've heard some complaints in the, our Discord server that the new version is out and people are like, oh no, now I like this 20 more times harder to search for the new uh, bugs and issues because it's like another version of Angular. But yes, naming could definitely be better. Um, okay, continuing. We got loopback version four released which is the framework for the API building for the backend. Never used it, so I don't really have anything to say about it. But uh, what I want to highlight is that this uh, specific version added the support for GraphQL, so integrated support, which seems to be the sort of um, ongoing theme across the whole, you know, all-in-one frameworks that provide you everything. They've been adding uh, GraphQL support for quite a lot of Quite a lot of them, and uh, yeah, loopback is the next one. So if you're working with loopback, do check out version four. If not, then well, check it out anyway. If you need to build uh, API uh, REST backend, maybe this is what you want because it's. I mean, at least they have a very nice website. It seems to be very, very pretty and uh, very nicely formatted. And uh, how about the documentation? The documentation also seems to be quite nice. So yeah, check it out if, if that sounds interesting. Okay, next thing we got is J Analytics version 3.1.0 from uh, Mr. Luke Edwards, the guy who builds Polka and a bunch of other super tiny libraries. So this is another crazy person who builds super tiny libraries. Uh, this time around, he updated his Google Analytics package that is a replacement for a default Google Analytics package that is super large. It's like a few kilobytes. And his package is just 323 bytes. It doesn't have all the features the Google Analytics provide, but it does have the basic stuff and you save, well, 41 kilobyte basically by taking this. So it is quite impressive. So, you know, if you're looking for a very small and simple Google Analytics package, check it out. This seems to be a really nice one. Next thing we got is, um, I mean, it's not exactly a version release, but you know what? I would highlight this anyway, because it is awesome. The uh, guys behind the code sandbox just shipped the VS code inside of code sandbox. So you can actually now go to code sandbox. You can now open your, um, I probably should just click create sandbox. You can now create a sandbox. Uh, it can be any sandbox, obviously. And when you go to your preferences in experiments, there will be a VS code and a browser toggle, which you can enable. And then you will get the full VS code experience over here, including the command palette, including the uh, tabs. Um, so let me just do this and this, and then I can, you know, have panes, tabs, um, whatever you can imagine. So you can actually split the windows. It is insane that this actually works and it's really, really cool. So do try it out. It seems to be pretty awesome. Okay. That's it for the releases this week. Now we come to the demos and libraries. And the first thing we got today is the 33 JS concepts repo that contains 33 concepts every JavaScript developer should know. Exactly what you would imagine. This basically walks you through the all the core concepts in JavaScript, like call stack, primitive types, equality, and equality with the type coercion, message queues, event loops, factories, closures, recursion, like everything that you would have to deal on daily basis, basic, or more or less on daily basis. Uh, even big O notation, if you've never heard about that, all of this is here and explained quite nicely through the set of links to the pretty good articles and videos, if you prefer watching videos. So if you're still learning JavaScript or you want to, you know, learn about the new concepts that you never heard about, like MapReduce and Filter, for example, there is a lot of really good videos and a lot of really good articles here. Do check this repo out. It has a very good collection of uh, JavaScript related things, essentially. Those are definitely the concepts that you should learn and 
at least understand on a high level, right? So like bitwise operators, yes, this is something I should learn more a bit and maybe use a bit more, but um, yeah, okay, <laughs> let's continue. The next thing we got is BBOB, Blazing Fast BB Code Transforming and Parsing Tool in Pure JavaScript. If you are still for some reason using BB Code and um, need to parse it, then yeah, there you go. You have a pure JavaScript BB Code parser and processor. So I honestly don't remember when was the last time I actually used BB Code. I think it was like five, seven years ago, maybe even more. I think everyone writes Markdown nowadays, but um, maybe you're still stuck on that really old version of forum that uses BB code and you just want your nice extension in a browser that would help you write it. So there you go. Okay, next thing we got is budget, a simply budget, uh, what no, a simple budget app that predicts where the expenses are being made. So if it would be just a simple budgeting app, that would be boring, right? So this just allows you to track your expenses. And the interesting bit about it is that it uses the KNN, so K nearest neighbor algorithm to predict where will you spend money, uh, which is, I mean, it's, it's a very silly use case, but it's an interesting one. And it's interesting to see how it was implemented in JavaScript. So if you're interested in seeing how to do KNN predictions with JavaScript on a basically a financial data, do check it out. This one will get you started quite nicely. Other than that is basically a toy app. So there's no real, um, um, so I would basically, I wouldn't use it daily, let's put it this way, but it's a good learning material. Okay, next thing we got is a React tabulator, a wrapper for the tabulator that we saw a bunch of like, I think two or three weeks ago, they released the version four. And uh, this is a React wrapper for it. Pretty straightforward, uh, very easy to use, no additional things required, does require loading styles. So uh, watch out for that. KNN is a machine learning. Um, I mean, I don't think that it's considered to be machine, I mean, kind of machine learning. I mean, it's a very basic regression, right? So um, I guess you could say, yeah, I mean, it is kind of, yeah, simplest of all machine learning algorithms is, is basically what you would learn when you just start learning about machine learning, because it's like the, the stupidest thing you can implement yourself. And it's very easy to implement. And it's, I mean, it performs okay in some cases. So yeah, I guess, yeah. I guess technically it is machine learning. <laughs> but okay, uh, let's continue. We got uh, just API next, easy and flexible API testing. This is a declarative spec-based taste framework for REST GraphQL APIs. Uh, looks very similar to Swagger actually, where you just define a file that describes your API using the spec definition, right? And then you run the binary on it and you get the tests automatically executed. Um, it doesn't really talk how is it different from Swagger because this was literally the first thing and I was like, that looks a lot like Swagger. What is the difference? But they don't really explain it well, but you know, maybe you were looking for something like this. I guess maybe Swagger doesn't really work with GraphQL. Maybe this would be the one of the advantages, but um, yeah, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Seems to be okay, I guess. Okay, next thing we got is an implementation of Huffman codes in Node.js. I honestly have no idea what Huffman Codes is. I think I've heard that name somewhere and I think it is related to the uh, compression algorithms. So there's a link here, let's check it out. Computer science and information theory, Huffman Code is a particular type of optimal prefix code that is commonly used for lossless data compression. Okay, so it is data compression based library. Um, I don't know what it does. I don't know what the Huffman codes are. So if that sounds interesting to you, do check it out. I basically have nothing to say about it aside from that. It seems to be nice. It have, it, it's implemented in JavaScript and uh, yeah, I, I don't really have much to say about that. Okay, next thing we got is a safe MD, safety first markdown rendering. Just as it says, a pretty basic safety-based markdown rendering uh, for your apps. It is written in Python and I somehow missed it and put it in JavaScript podcast, but I'm just gonna roll with it because you haven't seen anything. It's not Python, You have, there's, there was nothing here. You haven't seen anything. We're gonna continue. The next library we got is a React mock. It's a declarative mocks for React state and global APIs. 
which actually look pretty nice. So you got a bunch of components that you can use to wrap your own component you're testing that will provide mocking for different things like, for example, local storage or fetch or state or anything else, basically. Right? There's a bunch of um, higher components that can mock XHR requests, local storage and local states, which works pretty nice. And I, I mean, it, at least it looks convenient. I, I never needed to do anything like this and to mock that much stuff. I mean, for mocking servers, I typically use something like knock, but um, that does seems pretty convenient. So maybe check it out if, if you are looking into the mocking React components right now. Next thing we got is Primus GraphQL. Um, no, not NOC. Uh, it's called NOC.js, like literally N-O-C-K. It is a server mocking. It only works in uh, Node.js though, but it does allow you to create mock servers for just about everything and they are super flexible. Uh, if you're interested in the code samples, either look in their rep or look at the exoframe uh, because I do use it quite heavily there. Okay, back to libraries. We got Primus GraphQL, a flexible GraphQL client and server library that can be used to power real-time applications. This is basically, um, as it says, the GraphQL library for client and server, but focused around real-time data uh, interaction and data transfers, right? So it's based off the, or written together with RxJS, so you'd need it as a peer dependency and also uses GraphQL and Relay Runtime as peer dependency. So there's quite a bunch of uh, things that you would have to install along with it. But it does seem quite nice. I mean, you know, if you're looking for doing real-time GraphQL, do check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Next thing we got is Evergreen, a new design system for the web from the uh, segment guys. And uh, it's, yeah, my... For whatever reason, my ad blog just wants to block the whole segment website. I guess they, they are doing tracking or something. But uh, yeah, they have this framework and um, it looks pretty nice. And it seems like it's basically React components and nicely looking with a bunch of different things. Like if you want another one React UI kit, then have a look at that. It looks decent. So yeah, check it out. Next thing we got is CryptoHash by Mr. Sindrasaurus, the tiny hashing module that uses native crypto API in Node.js and the browser. So it works in both and uses native crypto, which means it's gonna be pretty efficient and super tiny, just 300 bytes minified and gzipped. And you can, there is a lot of hashes that it actually implements, uh, primarily SHA, so 1, 256, uh, 384 and 512. Uh, and uh, yes, you can ask for output formats and input format. This is really straightforward, really. It's just a hashing library, right? The fact that it actually works in browser and in Node.js makes it quite nice. Next thing we got is check if JS, JavaScript checking library. Uh, it's a tiny library that allows you to check for different things. If the value is null, nullable, nan, array, boolean, string, whatever you can imagine. So, you know, if you were looking for a, Standalone library for checking things, then do check this out. And if you did want to drag, say, Lodash uh, in your project, although, you know, at this point, uh, since Lodash actually supports code splitting and tree shaking, I don't see much need to use a standalone project for that. You could just drag a Lodash and use it partially. But, uh, you know, maybe you are looking for something like this. Next thing we got is Megasniff, better debugging for chained functions. Um, it's basically, yeah, basically a thing that you can uh, inject, I guess, into promises that would log your intermediate data and auto return it further so that you can actually um, do things without interrupting your actual logic, right? So it's a pretty straightforward concept and seems to be doing what it's supposed to do. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got is Schnack, simple node app for discus like drop-in commands on static websites. And there's even a website with, uh, I believe they had a demo somewhere, but I forgot where I saw that. Uh, quick start check, try Schnack, there we go. That's what it was. And uh, I don't know if I have, JavaScript permitted here. 
uh, GitHub. Do I have to allow you my email or no? You know what? I'm not going to allow you to do anything. But anyway, there's the comments and uh, it's a very straightforward commenting thing that is just drop in for the static websites. Just eight kilobytes seems to be very nice and very easy to set up. Essentially just one script and one tiny uh, initialization wherever you want to have it. So if you're looking to add comments to your static websites uh, that are not discus and are open source, then do check it out. Seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got is filter console, filter out unwanted console log output. Uh, exactly what it says, you just require the filter console module, then you can uh, create a new filter that filters something, for example, the strings, right? And then you just disable it once you no longer want it and will literally filter out the things that you don't want to see in the console, which seems like it could be quite useful. Also supports strings and regular expressions and functions as the filter values. So you can actually do some pretty complex filtering. Um, might be useful for some cases. Uh, I would say just use the logger that has logging levels that, that usually works better. But okay. Next thing we got is Aedes, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's a bare bone MQTT broker that can run on any stream server, the node way. Basically JavaScript based, Node.js based uh, MQTT broker server that you can run anywhere you want, has all the features that you would expect from MQTT broker. I honestly don't know why you would pick that over say RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ, but uh, I guess there are some cases, but I just don't not seeing them or maybe you know, not worked on anything like this. So if you know why you would want that, do check it out. It seems to be pretty solid with unit tests and everything and benchmarks and yeah, pretty good project. Next thing we got is X MySQL, one command to generate REST APIs from any MySQL database. We already seen a thing like this for Firebase, I think last time. This time around, we got the local uh, command line tool that basically generates uh, REST endpoint from your database automatically. You just throw it at your database and you got REST API that have a pretty straightforward format. So you get slash API slash table name and then depending on what you want to do, there's a bunch of either verbs or IDs or counting or it even has like aggregation functions and whatever. Seems to be pretty cool. Like if you, you know, if you need a quick API for accessing um, your MySQL database in a, uniform way that is not anything super specific, then this seems to be quite nice. That's, oh no, wait, that's the last one we have is uh, VLC.js. So VLC is the video line codec, or if you never heard about it, it's a, one of the sort of pretty big media players, right? That is basically has integrated support for just about any format you could imagine. And it's quite good. And somebody just took VLC and compiled it to WebAssembly and it actually works. <laughs> it is absolutely insane, but uh, boy, yeah, that, that, that actually works. You can just run VLC in your browser and um, there's a source code for that. So if that's, if that sounds like something you would want to investigate to check it out. It is insane, but it actually works. All right, um, that's it for the libraries and demos. Now we are at the silly section and um, there is a bunch of, well, interesting, silly and curious things. The first one being this pretty big vulnerability in LibSSH that was patched uh, recently. If you are using LibSSH anywhere, be sure to update all your packages and all your servers because, um, yeah, you can literally just pass a message to SSH to message user of success and older LibSSH versions will just ignore any authentication. It was just, yeah, okay, you're good. <laughs> it was a pretty terrible CVE and uh, yes, you do want to fix that as soon as you can. Uh, the link is in the document as usual. So if you want more details, there is obviously the whole uh, CVE over here. So do check it out and uh, be sure to update and just stay safe. All right, next thing we got is this really, really cool video. It was shared, I think it was shared by Bakao, right? It was you who shared, yes, it was Bakao. Okay, uh, the video is called, how freaking hard is it to understand the URL? UXSS CVE 2018-6128. 
So this is um, a very detailed overview of the universal XSS CVE that recently was found in Chrome for uh, iOS, I think it was. Security in Chrome for on iOS, yes. So, and uh, sort of very deep dive into these universal XSS as well as the URL parsing and why is it complicated to understand one simple URL. It is absolutely fascinating. It is not very long, it's just 15 minutes and I highly recommend checking it out because it is really, really cool. And uh, once again, thank you for sharing the link. It is just great. I mean, URL spec is terrifying. That is, yeah, that is for sure. <laughs> okay, um, the next thing we got is this Kickstarter that I wanted to highlight It's called Modules and uh, it's a Kickstarter for the visual coding uh, editor slash IDE, I guess. So if you if you fancy the visual editing IDEs and if you want to check this one out, do have a look. It seems to be pretty cool. It has a bunch of nice features. I will not start it right now because, um, yeah, because, you know, sound, we don't want to have that. But uh, the link as usual, as I said in the documents, do check it out. This seems to be quite an interesting project. And if you have any spare money, make sure to support it. It looks quite nice. And the last thing we got is a bit of a crazy stuff for you. So there is a, a person on GitHub who is apparently crazy enough uh, to create um, an interpreter for a Turing complete programming language based on Spotify playlists. Just let that sink for a second. You can, you can, um, yes, it, it's loosely based off BrainFuck and based on Spotify playlists. So you can actually program things. It's a Turing complete language and you write things using Spotify playlists. <laughs> like, why, why is this cat? Hi, cat, yes. Okay, um, anyway, you can now write your code in, in Spotify playlists. So you wanna see how that was made, or if you want maybe write a few Spotify playlists that parse URL spec maybe, do check it out. It is pretty fascinating and absolutely insane. Okay. That is actually it from my side. Uh, that's all I have for today, for this week. Um, right, uh, one more thing I wanna say, apologies if there is a bit of an echo here. I recently uh, rearranged some stuff in my room and I've ordered some more acoustic foam to kill the echo completely, but that is gonna come only next week. So uh, for now, you know, we have this a bit of a tiny echo going in background, which annoys me to no extent. Uh, but yeah, guys, if you have any questions or any things that you want to share, do feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, then we can wrap this up right here and go have cool rest of the weekend and uh, do some, I don't know, watch some movies, play some games or listen to some music or whatever you want. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me. Uh, I mean, always great to see you guys in the chat. Always awesome to see you in a Discord server. We have a Discord server. Be sure to join it and uh, talk to us about JavaScript. We love doing it over there. So yes, um, once again, thank you. Thank you so much for supporting me. That really means a lot. And your thank you means a lot as well. <laughs> All right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or any more links that I've missed. So thank you guys very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you are watching the VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.